great pleasure in having been asked to share my thoughts and views on education transformation in Trinidad and Tobago, something about which I'm very passionate. I grew up with a father who was an avid gardener. As a little girl, I would sit on a bench he built for me on afternoons and watch, watch, watch him create what for me was magic. The magic was the transformation that I saw take place slowly from seed to produce that made its way into our kitchen and eventually into our bellies. Nevertheless, the transformation didn't happen just so. And I took note, and now, I, as I reflect as an adult, I understand that what my father was teaching me while I sat on that bench was a way of life, an understanding of how we ought to behave in life if we want to grow and if we want to know. The transformation occurred because of four key deliberate actions. One, my father created an environment in which the plant could thrive. And I noted that not all environments were suited for all plants, and that unless the seed was put into the right environment, it would not bear fruit. This taught me purpose. The growth process required sustained commitment supervision, care, and monitoring, wetting and mulching, fertilizing where necessary, and so on. Thirdly, my father knew what he was doing. He was quite confident. He knew how to move the seed to produce. He was competent. If he wasn't sure about anything, he had his gardener friends with whom he would consult and collaborate, and he would also do his research. Fourthly, my father operated from a position of love. You only had to see him come alive when he was tended to, tending to his plants. When it came to taking care of them, he left nothing untouched. He was most concerned about the plant that seemed weak, and he was determined to do all in his power to ensure that these particular plants succeeded. Education transformation is much like doing great gardening like my father did. It is about unlocking value. The outcome is to grow our children into productive, functional, global citizens. It means creating and implementing policies and practices along the lines of or undergirded by inclusivity, differentiation, and equity that ensure that all students, like the plants, are placed in an environment in which they can thrive and their value can be realized and honed. It therefore cannot be a one-size-fits-all approach. This is one reason why we need transformation. Another key reason why we need transformation is because we are preparing students for the future for a future that is uncertain and with social and cultural issues that we don't even know about. We therefore must be predictive. The question I'm sure you all are asking yourselves is, well, how do we do it? In this short time that I've been allotted, I will offer a few ideas. If we really want to transform education, we must focus on making schools places of belonging for all our stakeholders, 
I'm going to repeat that because this is the thesis of my presentation. And this is the crux of the matter. This is where the box stops. We must, if we really want to transform education, we have to focus on making schools places of belonging for all our stakeholders. This philosophy must undergird all that we do. It is simple. If people feel they belong, they feel valued. If they feel valued, they and those they work with have high expectations of each other and are therefore inclined to work together to meet those expectations. We therefore need to innovate. And on this matter of innovation, I know it's a word that is bandied around quite a lot, but on the matter of innovation, I will address three key issues that relate to any sort of educational transformation or that would drive real educational transformation. The three innovative dimensions are one, strengthening the pedagogical core. We must innovate the pedagogical core. And the core elements are the learners, the educators, the content, the learning resources. But that's not sufficient. We also have to address the matter of the dynamics that connect those elements, pedagogy and formative evaluation, the use of time, and the organization of educators and learners. The second key innovative dimension is leadership. Leadership must not just be proactive. Leadership must be predictive and become formative organizations with strong learning leadership. Strong design with vision and strategies and constantly informed by self-review and evidence on learning achieved. So the focus is on learning and the focus is on reflecting on self and organization. The third innovative dimension I will mention is open up to partnerships not just to collaborate, but to open up to partnerships. For example, create synergies and find ways to enhance professional, social, and cultural capital with the others. Do this with families, communities, higher education, cultural institutions, businesses, and especially other schools and learning environments. I know a lot of talk is, is taking place about curriculum change, and I will touch on this very slightly. I want to point out some four key areas that relate to curriculum change. And these relate to the key outcomes of curriculum change. So as we engage in this discourse on curriculum change, let us engage with a purpose and let us know what we want at the end of it. Curriculum change refers to any conscious, deliberate attempt to engender change in the curriculum of a school or school system which should produce four key outcomes. One, a new structure. Two, new teaching practices. Three, new curriculum materials. Four, change in beliefs or understandings. Thus, while curriculum change can be beneficial, its benefits are not a given, since they depend on a confluence of, of factors coming together. But above all, I wanted to make this point, and I want to make it very clear. Systems and structures do not in and of themselves bring about change. It is people who do so. Therefore, the most important outcome of curriculum change, if we are to have transformation, is changing beliefs and understandings of stakeholders. In other words, 
We need cultural change. I know people like to refer to countries like Finland and Singapore to benchmark high-performing education systems. But we must remember that in these contexts, educators are highly valued, and there's an embedded culture of adapting, and most importantly, understanding the notion of failing fast and failing forward. I say any kind of learning involves three key areas. One, collaboration. Two, the road is not going to be easy. And chances are you will fail before you succeed. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take that journey. And the third area, and, and you know, you can probably say it's the most, one of the most important areas, is research. You have to know what to do, how to do it, why you do it. And therefore, you have to answer those key questions. You have to know the what, the so what, and the now what. Transformation rests within that now what area. It's not sufficient to just know. It's not sufficient for me to come here and just espouse theory and that kind of thing for you. We have to be on all committed to the journey of where, what now? What are we going to do now? I leave you with this. Well, before I leave you with this, leadership is critical to achieving any form of transformation. In the educational context, the transformation we are looking for, in particular, is the transformation in learning, learning at all levels, but key, student learning. And where transformation is the goal, and improving student learning is the outcome. Teacher quality is one of the most significant factors to improve student learning and to transform any society. I leave you with this. Let us all as education stakeholders ask and answer honestly the question, is the work I am doing having the impact that it should. Once you have asked and answered that question, then let's take action. Education transformation is a call to action. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.